Welcome back to Turpentine VC, a podcast where we discuss the art and science of building successful venture firms, VC to VC. Today's episode is a throwback to a conversation I had with Parker Conrad, now the founder and CEO of Rippling, and Parker Thompson, then partner at Angelist, about how much value investors provide to founders, if any at all. They get into the issues around misalignment of incentives between investors and founders, and debate the frame of founder-friendly versus company-friendly. It's a great conversation. Let's dive in. Hey, everybody. Welcome to another episode of Venture Stories by Village Global. I'm here today with two very exciting guests, Parker Thompson and Parker Conrad. Guys, welcome to the podcast. Thanks. Thanks. There's a lot of history with this one. There's also the ghost of Startup Bill Jackson uh, in the room. It was unclear for a time whether it was Parker Thompson, Parker Conrad. Why don't you guys give a little bit of context on, on your relationship and how we got here today and what we're going to talk about. Before Startup Bell Jackson was revealed as Parker Thompson, there was a period of time when there were a couple of people that thought it was me, a couple of people in the press. And I, I it had remember, to feel great. You know, sadly, it wasn't me, but I remembered being like absolutely thrilled about this and uh, talking to actually the, the guy who ran PR for my last company um, about like, you know, was there anything we could do to sort of like fan the flames of these rumors? Mostly because I think it's always a good idea to sort of appear smarter than you are. And, at, you know, Startup Bell Jackson was certainly like a real a real presence on Twitter. So sadly, it wasn't me, unfortunately. Uh, my version of the story was just like, I got a text from somebody that I know well who got a text from somebody at TechCrunch. And he's like, they know it's a Parker. They're on, they're on to you. And I'm like, uh-oh, well. And, you know, I had known Parker Conrad just online and we met once or twice. So I texted him a screenshot of this and I'm like, just do what you will with this man. Like, <laughs> let's like mess with TechCrunch. And to their credit, Ryan Lawler, who wrote a great, you know, he wrote a great piece on this after it all came out. You know, they're real journalists uh, and did not publish it. But, you know, Ryan had this great, like, great theory and he was mapping it all out and digging through the Zenefits timeline. And he's like, it's got to be this guy. It was, it was beautiful. <laughs> and you guys recently had a recent Twitter exchange about investors, about founders. Why don't you unpack that a little bit? Yeah. So that I think motivated this conversation. So, I mean, I would just say, first of all, the reason I think we both want to do this is, you know, talking to founders about what investors are good for, what they're not good for, how you should work with them is important. I mean, we do it all the time offline and, um, you know, founders aren't experts in this stuff. Most of them, it's their first time doing it. So I hope this conversation is useful to founders. Personally, I'm just doing it for the Parker versus Parker yeah. infographic. Like, I'm hoping there's like a well, I had Shreem, like a Daily Show style, like yeah. I had Sriram Krishnan like and combat the, system or something. The so. other Sriram Krishnan, so I'm doing a set of yeah, exactly. Names Shreem, Shreem, Parker, Parker. So I tweeted out something after a day of conversations about found, founder friendliness, combined with a day of talking to founders who had been let down by investors in certain ways, and I was just like somewhat frustrated you know, tweeted a thing out about like, you know, some investors being like the cool parent who buys their kid booze or something because they want to be liked rather than do what's good for their kid. That's terrible metaphor. VCs are not parents. Startups are not children, which I was rightly taking to task for. But nonetheless, the problem is there, right? Where, um, you know, founders aren't getting everything they need and, and could be much more successful. So that's, you know, the conversation we started off. But one thing you, you would say, Parker Thompson, is that you would say that investors have seen, you know, hundreds or sometimes even thousands of more, more companies and so have more context over certain situations. And I think Parker Conrad, not startable Jackson, might bristle at the idea that investors know more or have better context on, on certain things. Is that well, fair? Yeah. I mean, I just think context is, is really tricky. So, I mean, totally putting aside the, the question of just incentives and whether investors actually want the right thing for you and your company, which like most of the time I think they do, but there are some, some occasions where interests diverge. I think it's really hard for even someone who is incredibly smart, incredibly knowledgeable in your space to have sort of useful advice about your company. And, and the basic problem is just that investors are around you know, one day a quarter, if even that, you know, maybe just a few hours a quarter. And every company is like very unique and, and sort of different in its own way. And so often like what you should do in certain situations and how you should handle, you know, most of the problems that you encounter someone like you're much better off taking the advice of your executive team that's there, you know, 24 seven with you over an investor who might have a lot more experience, but just like has no idea the reality of the situation on the ground. 
I mean, I think that's right. Look, what I always say to founders, I actually, sometimes you have founders that take you too literally, right? They're like, oh, you must know what you're talking about. So I try to often preface advice by saying like, look, you think about this 24 seven and I've been thinking about it for five minutes as a way of sort of saying like, look, like ultimately you got to make the call. But I think the other thing I try personally to do to avoid that problem is like, I shouldn't be making the decision for you as an investor. What I should be trying to do is accepting all of the things you're telling me as truth because you, you know your business, and then trying to help you construct a framework so that you can make a decision, that to me is a good exercise for investors to think about because ultimately it's not my decision and I don't have the context. But what I do have is a bunch of information from a bunch of different conversations with other companies and experiences that may or may not be useful to you. And I don't actually know whether they're useful to you, but I can present them and you can walk away and sleep on it, take that to your executive team and then make do, the call. Do you think that's similar to a role that an executive coach might play? Yeah, I was thinking investor as therapist, someone who you can sort of like, who can talk you through your problems and yeah, no, but hopefully that's right. get, a, get at like, the right answer that, you know. No one ever says that's their value add. I actually think therapist is the number one value add, at least at the early stage. Yeah, I was being dead serious. Just, I wasn't, yeah. No one, no one says that because like the founder on the front end, when they're buying, the buyer's not buying that, right? They're buying prestige or something. And were you being serious about it in a sort of, in a way that underplays that? Is that a, a very important role or is that sort of, hey, a lot of different people could play that role? So I actually think it is, it is a way that an investor can, can be very valuable. And, and I think like, I mean, honestly, like for me as a CEO, in my experience, like probably the number one thing I need is like therapy. You know, it's just like, it's so stressful. But do you think there's expertise in that right. therapy? Like someone with 30 years versus just a very Well, so I mean, that, that's probably where, you know, I'm not sure the extent to which it needs to be an investor that that is doing that. I think, you know, being a founder can be like a really lonely exercise. So I think it's good to have... It's good to have someone or multiple someones that can sort of help you talk through a lot of these issues and you can bounce ideas off of, even if they're not actually contributing a lot to the conversation, just, you know, having that kind of just conversational interaction can be really helpful for you to think things through on your own. A couple of questions. One is what are the ways in which investors can evaluate? Another question is I sort of get the sense that you believe that VCs are vastly sort of overrated in the value that they do provide. And if so, what are the implications of that? Yeah. Well, I think maybe first it's, I mean, you know, a lot of, I mean, most investors talk about how they add value to their entrepreneurs. And I don't think it's, it's that, you know, it's impossible for that to happen, but I think it's like far more likely to be the opposite that you know, I think that most investors that get involved in companies are value destroying. And so one question is like, why do, why do investors feel a need to hold themselves out as a value added investor? And I'm, I'm like convinced that this is really, you know, a pantomime that investors perform for their LPs that, you know, they have to present themselves as a value added investor because otherwise they're, they're just money. And if, if you're just money, you know, why are you taking, you know, 2% and 20% of the other or three and 30 or, you know, whatever it is at a particular fund. And so investors have to say, look, this company is going to be a lot more successful because of my involvement and founders are going to give me, you know, you know, better pricing in order to get me into the round. And I think, I think there are some very meaningful ways that investors can add value. And one of the biggest ones I think is just brand imprimatur. Being able to say to the outside world, like, look, Sequoia or, you know, firm, firm whatever has like looked at this deal and given it its stamp of approval. That the impact of that is real. You get, you get fewer questions from prospects. You know, they're less likely to, you know, ask you like, how long are you guys going to be around and how long have you been around? And, you know, what are we going to do if you guys go under? And you're more likely when your, you know, your recruiters are reaching out to engineers, they're more likely to respond. When you're talking to partners, like you're more likely to be able to get meetings. Your next round of investors are more likely to sort of come to that initial pitch meeting, excited to meet with you and, and hear about it and like, you know, thinking, oh man, this is, this is a live one. Like we've got to, we got to be engaged. And that stuff is all real, but it's, it's not a, it's not something the investor is actively doing for you. It, it's really, it's getting the logo more than anything else that, um, that, that really matters. And you mentioned that the board is another element where they're sometimes just doing it to please their LPs. Investors taking board seats. Oh yeah, I mean we so um, we were we were talking before like why do you know if investors aren't adding value like why you know they often insist on being on your board and I think the the reason that a lot of investors need to be on your board is more than anything it's the way that their own LPs judge them so. 
sometimes when companies get really successful, it can be hard for LP. You know, if suddenly all these investors come out of the woodwork and everyone, you know, has, you know, has put down on LinkedIn or on AngelList or something, you know, early investor in XYZ. Um, and sometimes as a founder, you, you might not even like know like half the people who, who do that. And so for LPs, it gets really tricky to figure out like who who actually was sort of a material investor and who just kind of threw in a little bit of money early on or even like bought some secondary shares on the side. Because all these um, folks are spinning out to raise their own fund. They're all trying to raise their own fund. And so the, the LPs often look at this as like, okay, who is the board member? Because that's the person that I give like the deal credit to. It's almost like a like a deal registration kind of thing. I think it's unfortunate for the entire ecosystem that, I mean, I understand why VCs need that. It's almost like there should be like some central registration system on like who, like who actually did this round <clears throat> so that investors don't feel the need to sort of go on boards. And, you know, I mean, obviously there are other reasons that, you know, they, you know, they, they want to protect the investment. There are some very occasional critical decisions about a company that are made at the board level. And when those happen, it, it you know, it tends to be that the people who have like a seat at the table are the ones that are kind of like taken care of. And the, you know, if you don't have a seat at the table, you don't get taken care of. I'm curious, brand signal aside, like who's been, and you don't have to name, but like what was the most useful thing that an investor did, ever did for you or um, the most useful investor who's been on your board or not on your board and, and, did impactful things for your company. We talked about sort of the brand issue. I think there are other ways that I think investors can add value. One of them is um, I found a lot of investors helpful talking about things that sort of that at the time that seemed sort of not very significant to me. You know, I thought I was going to talk to investors about you know big strategy questions, product stuff, and where I thought investors add value was more stuff like, hey, I had this weird interaction with an executive, like. You know, I said something and they said something weird back and I'm not, should I just ignore it? Should I, you know, go talk to them and follow up? You know, how big of a deal is this and how, you know, just that kind of like interpersonal stuff that I found, um, I found investors to be extremely helpful on. Were they operator investors or, I mean, we kind of have this debate, right? Do you go with the operator? <laughs> yeah. I mean, so have empathy or think they can do your job better than you. I, I mean, I think that's probably, I mean, I haven't, I haven't sort of like tried that with sort of financial investors, but you know, definitely with, with operator investors, I found that to be, you know, to be sort of super useful. And I think that investors are incredibly helpful on the fundraising side. So I remember um, one of our, my seed investors at, at Rippling and at Zenefits before that is a guy named Alad Gill, who you guys probably know from the high growth handbook. And Alad was, was incredibly helpful to us around fundraising. I mean, there were certain critical junctures where he, he really like, I mean, I basically spoke with him almost not at all. And then when we were raising money, like he was, you know, sort of all hands on deck and uh, uh, things would just, rounds would just not have come together if it weren't for his involvement. And they're around introductions, also back channeling. Introductions. How can investors be helpful how do, you, how do you set up a process? How, who to go into, who not to go into? You know, he just really understood all the firms out there. And then sort of later on, what happens is your Series A investors you know, every subsequent round that you do, you know, your Series B, your Series C, your Series D investors are all going, they're going to come talk to your Series A investor, like maybe even before they talk to you about the company. And, and your Series A investor will end up, or anyone who's sort of like, you know, one of the sort of, you know, a big, big part of the cap table is, is going to end up being like almost as much a part of that fund, subsequent fundraising process as you will be. And so you need someone who, who can be, one, can be effective at that. Um, some of that is brand, both personal brand as well as the firm's brand. You also, it matters a lot how much they care about you. And so one of the sort of really awful dynamics that you can get into as an entrepreneur is, you know, when, when subsequent round investors come and talk to your VC, they're going to ask them like, hey, who's, uh, who's, who's hot in your portfolio these days? Like, who's, who's really good? Who's doing well? And, you know, that investor is going to give them, you know, one or two names. They're like, I really like this company and this company is doing amazing. And if you're not one of the two names that they give them, you're in deep trouble because that sends a signal. Like you, no investor is going to sort of act, you know, trash talk their company, but you might not be at the top of the list of the the companies that they're like saying really great things about to, to the outside world. So I, you listen, I think that investors can add value in a bunch of different ways. My sort of objection to the, the value added investor thing there's really two. One is that I think that the you have to view all of this in context. 
And I think like given everything that an investor can do for a company, the amount of value that they add is probably as much value as like a really good director level hire in your company, but something less than like a really solid VP. It's it's not immaterial, it's not nothing, but you know, I think that founders probably shouldn't be giving up like a lot more equity or taking much worse deal terms in order to get the, the value add of sort of one one particular investor. And the second, it just sort of like muddies the relationship dynamic around sort of what an investor really is. Like I remember there was one VC firm that I visited once where they have a, they have a big thing on their wall that says, um, you know, we view ourselves as a service provider to entrepreneurs. And I've always kind of thought about that, like, you know, gosh, like at the time my wife and I were living in an apartment in the mission and, you know, we had just hired a plumber to come by our house to fix, like we had a sewage backing up through our sink. And I was like, a, a plumber is a service provider to, you know, homeowners and renters. But if you go to a, like a plumber's like office, like they don't have like a, a banner on the wall. Like, you know, we view ourselves as a service provider to homeowners because like, yeah, of course, like everyone knows that a plumber is a, so yeah, yeah. just the fact, like even the way that VC sort of describe that, like immediately makes me sort of very suspicious that that's like actually the case. You know, this reminds um, me, uh, you know, I was talking to a realtor and he gave me his, his pamphlet, right? And it, it read like a VC pamphlet. He literally said the word value add on it. Value add realtor. I don't yeah. Take commissions, and, you know, right? no, but that's the thing, right? It's like, of course, like uh, when you're in the business of selling money or paper in the transaction, um, you kind of gotta, you gotta say it, you gotta say it to yourself, you gotta say it out loud. You know? uh, when you fix somebody's toilet, they know you add value. You don't, need to, you don't they don't need to say it. You know. Yeah. Hey, we'll continue our interview in a moment after a word from our sponsors. Over 100 startups launched today. Do you know who they are? If you're not seeing interesting startups, none of your downstream processes matter. How you source deals at the earliest stages could be your most consequential investment. Harmonic is the most complete startup database, finding new companies as soon as they incorporate and tracking them through IPO. You can create a search tailored to your investment thesis. In one search, filter over company data, including venture stage, industry, and geography, founders and operators backgrounds, and traction metrics like headcount changes, social media audience, and web traffic growth. Importantly, Harmonic instantly surfaces warm connections to help you connect with founders. The results are delivered on autopilot, wherever you most need them. Over Slack, email, or via API, directly into your CRM, integrating seamlessly into your software stack. Learn why Craft, Bedrock, NEA, and hundreds more. Trust Harmonic's data by visiting harmonic.ai or use the link in the description. Make sure you mention our podcast, Turpentine VC, during your demo. Hey all, I'm hearing more and more that founders want to get profitable and do more with less, especially with engineering. Listen, I love your 30-year-old ex-fang senior software engineer as much as the next guy, but honestly, I can't afford them anymore. Founders everywhere are trying to turn to global talent, but boy, is it a hassle to do at scale, from sourcing to interviewing to on-the-ground operations and management. That's why I teamed up with Sean Lanahan, who's been building engineering teams in Vietnam at a very high level for over five years to help you access global engineering without the headache. Squad, Sean's new company, takes care of sourcing, legal compliance, and local HR for global talent so you don't have to. With teams across Asia and South America, we can cover you no matter which time zone you operate in. Their engineers follow your process and use your tools. They work with React, Next.js, or your favorite front-end frameworks. And on the back end, they're experts at Node, Python, Java, and anything under the sun. Full disclosure, it's going to cost more than the random person you found on Upwork that's doing two hours of work per week but billing you for 40. But you'll get premium quality at a fraction of the typical cost. Our engineers are vetted top 1% talent and actually working hard for you every day. Increase your velocity without amping up burn. Head to choose squad.com and mention Turpentine to skip the wait list. So I think, you know, when sometimes founders ask, like, how do you find, you know, good investors and value add investors? And I'm like sort of a little bit nihilistic about it. You're this. like, you don't. Well, my, my view is like, look, like, honestly, like what's most likely going to happen is, is you're going to find an investor who's going to destroy a lot of value in your company. And if you can, if you can find someone who, who doesn't, um, like aim for that. Yeah, you and Manu Co Coslo. <laughs> I mean, look, I don't think that we're, completely in opposition on this, but let me make a different case, right? And I'm operating very much at the seed stage. Many of the founders that I meet with, they just haven't been through this process at all. They don't know what they don't know. 
Um, and they make a lot of mistakes along the way, right? Uh, and so I think that what you can find is people who can help you avoid some unforced errors along the way. And the way in which investors can do that or where they might be different than a director is like, you just don't want a director who's an expert in fundraising and fundraising milestones and these sorts of things. They're mostly useless. And then when you get into that part of the cycle where you need to go talk to VCs, they're very useful, right? What you want is someone who's in that world all the time, who knows enough about your business and enough about the industry that you're in to help you think through questions like, how much money should we raise? What are the milestones against which we're going to be judged in the next round? How should we think about contingency planning? For example, like what kind of investor syndicate should we put together such that if we make some mistakes, because shit happens, we're going to be in a good position going forward, right? And so what I see a lot of the time is companies who have created structural risk in their company by just not making good decisions. And I think a lot of that is just a function of just not having advice or not thinking about going out there. And it's hard to tease out sort of the difference between, you know, you're just not talking to people who are good and can help you with that from this notion of founder friendliness. I think part of this conversation was motivated by the idea that founders are unwilling to give critical feedback to companies because they want to be their buddy and get a reference and whatever. I I think there's some of that. I'm actually not I haven't seen as much of that as more the the former. But so I do think that that's where like a VC can add value, right? Um, If you call me, I can tell you what your Series A milestones are going to be. I can tell you if you're tracking towards them. And I talk to way too many companies that have executed really well on the wrong things for 18 months, and they're just not going to raise that A. So that to me is the problem. And if you're going to go hire someone in quotes, it's going to be an investor, right? You're going to hire an expert who happens to have money. So hire people who, you know, when you talk to them, they can give you actual constructive feedback on what you should maybe be thinking about doing differently. They don't have to be right, but they should have a thought beyond like, good job, man. Like you just go do you and here's some money. Because I I think those people are not not value add at all. Um, Even if they're not value subtract, there's there's a level of value add you can expect on maybe you could call it on a superficial level, but if you and I sit down and you tell me about your business for 20 minutes, I should be able to say something intelligent, not just yeah. not be a jerk. Yeah. I mean, so some of this, like, I think the, the tweet that you sent out, it talked about like being founder friendly versus company. Yeah. So like some of my objection to that is, is like that specific, like pendulum, like setting it up as like, you know, founder versus company. And some of it's just like all the things you mentioned, like, yeah, totally. Like, I mean, I always tell investors like, look, I, you know, I see one deal like every two years. So you're going to know much more than I will about sort of what the market's like, what are deal terms, what, what do you kind of metrics do you have to achieve to get to a solid, you know, series B, you know, based on our metrics, what's realistic for us to, to look for and achieve. Cause like as a founder, you have no way of knowing that you're at a, just a real information disadvantage going into any fundraising process. So like anything about fundraising, investors are going to know a lot about that and like can, can be like very, very helpful. The problem that I have is like when it's set up as like founder friendly versus company friendly, like all of that stuff is like very founder friendly to sort of, you know, tell founders about that stuff and just be like, look, you don't have the metrics to do this. Like you need to, you need to double your revenue or you're in deep trouble in six months. When you set it up as founder friendly versus company friendly, it, it implies that those two things are like opposed. So it's sort of like, or it sets up this straw man that already sort of like concedes the point to an investor that's maybe not founder friendly. I'll tell you why I think that's a good frame, which is look, I think actually when you frame it as company friendly, it forces us to get on the same side of the table. Like this goes both ways, right? Like you want a better valuation for the company and that's in the best interest of the company. Make that case in that way. And then if I'm really just trying to get a better deal for me as the investor, then I'm the jerk who's like arguing against the company's best interest, right? And it just becomes obvious. So for me, framing it as what's in the best company's best interest gets us on the same side of the table. So sometimes that's a founder saying like, actually, I'm really greedy for my personal equity. So I'm going to raise a round that's too small at too high a valuation. And I would say to that founder, not, hey, man, I want a lower valuation. I think it's much more constructive to say, here are the reasons why that's going to make it much more likely that the company is going to fail. 
That's not in the company's best interest. I happen to think, by the way, you as the founder should be thinking about the company's best interest because you've got a portfolio of one. So I feel like that frame allows us to collaborate as long as we're not being disingenuous. I'll disagree with that a little bit just because I think that when VCs you know, first started talking about being founder-friendly, you know, probably coming out of the, the 2009 crash, suddenly there were all these firms cropping up that talked about you know, their sort of founder-friendliness. I don't think any of them were taking the point of view that they were being founder friendly at the expense of doing the right thing for the company. I think they're, the reason that they said that is they thought that being founder friendly was like the surest way to actually make the company successful. I don't, I don't think so. I mean, I think that what it really comes down to at the Series A, particularly at the Series A, which is really where you saw this happening, but you know, beyond, the market is such today that these are very competitive. And the company doesn't choose who to invest in it. The founders do. So I really think it's a very cognizant marketing choice. Like I'll give you an example. I heard a story the other day of a fund that prides itself of being founder friendly, where they had taken a board seat and they had to fire the CEO. But because their fund's brand was founder friendly, the person had to leave the board before they fired the CEO because they had to maintain this this, this illusion that like, of course, we're going to do the right thing by the company, which we think is firing the CEO, but we're going to pretend that we're founder friendly because we need to win the next deal. That's performance art, right? And it's oriented around the founder as opposed to the company. So let me, so let me ask a slightly different question. Putting aside, like if, if everyone's saying, okay, look, you know, we want to do what's in the right in the interests of the company, which I think most founders genuinely do, when sort of the, the founder of a company and the investors disagree, the question is kind of how do you resolve yeah, that? Yeah, yeah. I think, I mean, it's case by case. Like sometimes there are, there are founders, for example, like a common reason a founder needs to leave a company is they are exceptional during the chaos phase of a company. And every company succeeds by escaping the chaos phase, right? You move out of pre-product market fit, you get to scaling, and some founders just can't do that. And what, how, they, how they respond to that is they start throwing bombs into their own company, right? So I think a good investor will try to help that person either succeed at that role or help them understand that actually they've done a great job getting into here. They should go do that part that they're really good at and let someone else take over. But I'm not saying like the investor is necessarily smarter there, but I'm saying like there's a fact pattern where we can sometimes all agree this person is just not doing this job well. I mean, obviously, there, there are cases where founders need to leave the companies that they found. Or leave the but, role. Like or just leave the role or whatever. I, I guess I kind of – like this, the whole setup, though, to your point is that – is that the investor is sort of a, like a neutral arbiter of that? I don't, yeah, I, I just I don't think so. I agree with you that it's well. How, VCs so, can fuck up companies. We agree. <laughs> yeah, a board can fuck up a company. Um, a more common case than removing you as CEO is it's very common for the CTO to not be a good VP eng and to coach those people into a role that's better for them over time. Like that's. It'd be interesting to look at percentages, but more often than not, I think people who are good on the engineering side at building companies early don't end up being good at scaling them. Yeah. Less often, I think the CEO visionary, that's where you can fuck up a company, I think, where you're like, look, let's put in, you know, uh, gosh, who was the guy who replaced Jobs at Apple, right? This is the classic example. Go to, from selling sugar water to selling... John Scully? Scully, um, yeah. Yeah. So, you know, we can blame VCs for doing that, which is where it's... You should want to work with humble people because if you work with people who think they can do your job better than you, they might try. Yeah, gosh, I'm, I'm like trying. I'm trying to think about how to how to respond to that. But it, it seems to me that like when you know when founders and investors disagree, I guess what I what, what I don't like is the dynamic that's arisen where people sort of say, look, <clears throat> whether or not the founder, like I I get, it. I totally grant that there are some cases where someone can't continue in the job. But we've sort of set up this system where, for some reason, it's like the person who's put some money into the company that we designate as sort of like the ar the sort of arbiter of that. Why the question is like why is that? And like on some basic level, it's because like they negotiated those rights as part of the investment agreement. And so I think there's a fair question of like, well, as a founder, like should you be willing to sort of give them that right? I think for for me personally, I look at this as like. Look, I'm interested in having investors, you know, as partners. I'm, I'm interested in their advice. We definitely, you know, need capital, but I'm like not personally like very interested in giving them like a giant red button, sort of a self destruct button that they can like push, you know, at, at any moment in time. So then I think 
one sort of, I think, more interesting question to me is like, okay, when founders and, and investors disagree, who's more likely to represent the interests of the company? Because obviously there are cases where an entrepreneur might be wrong. There are cases when an investor might be wrong. So then it gets to a question of incentives. Um, and I'll make the case for why I think like founders generally are like everything that you said being true, why I think founders are a lot more likely to be sort of operating the interests of the company than investors. And I think there are really two. It comes down to, because basically when, when a VC wants to do something with a company, a VC can be wrong in two ways. One, they can actually sort of have the wrong incentives. Like they can be like doing something that, you know, they know is probably not they need in liquidity. the interest of the company. Yeah. Well, and I think there's more than that. And I think, and, and the second one is like, they can just be wrong. And so the second one to me is like, is kind of easy. On the one hand, like VCs are sort of like not their day to day, which maybe in, in some cases like gives them a little, a little more objectivity, but I think it's far more likely to cause them to misread the situation, mm-hmm. to not really understand the day to day reality of what's going on at the company, what's happening on the ground, the market dynamics. You know, they're, they're making, you know, big decisions off of like very small amounts of like largely anecdotal data. Mm-hmm. And then the second thing is like, how do VCs, like in what ways are investors actually misaligned with the interests of the company? You know, for founders, founders tend to, I, I really believe the founders are putting the interests of the company first. And the reason is, is that one, like founders, to your point, they have a portfolio of one. It's like their entire life is invested in this company. But more than the financial investment is the fact that they're just there all the time. Like as a founder, you probably feel a lot of affection for the company and the people around it. And that, that's, that's not always true of investors. Investors, I think there are a couple things that can come before the interests of the company for an investor. Like I kind of rank them as like, you know, the, the first thing for an investor is usually their personal brand. So if, you know, there is a case where for as an investor, your personal brand is like misaligned with that of the company, that's very dangerous because a lot of investors, you know, their career, their future deal flow, like it's all about, you know, their, their personal brand and sort of, the press that they're getting about this and the way they're perceived by LPs in the larger market. And I think that, you know, the second thing is, you know, the brand of their firm for the same reason, which actually can be sometimes different than, than their own personal brand. Um, and then the third thing are, is, is the, re- the returns of their firm, mm-hmm. <clears throat> which is where what you mentioned comes in. You know, they need, they need liquidity on investment or they need timeline market markups, or, scale about, you know, coming, something yeah. like that. And then I think the fourth thing is like making the company successful. And so while I think it's like, 99% of the, it's true that 99% of the time, the interests of investors and the interests of the company are aligned. And, you know, it, it, it is true that, you know, life is long and often in the course of, you know, five to 10 years of building a company, there are cases where suddenly you find yourself on the opposite, opposite side of the table from an investor and they're not actually acting yeah. in, in, in the interests of the company. I, I guess for me, it's kind of like, well, like I don't have a solution to this problem. Like I'm not I'm not saying that founders are always right, but I also don't sort of buy into the idea that like investors are sort of trusted neutral third parties that yeah, are in a position to sort of like adjudicate that. No, no, I don't think they're neutral at all. I mean, I think we're using investor and board member interchangeably, which obviously there's a lot of overlap, right? Yeah. In practice, what you're doing is you're accumulating a set of partners as you go and over time giving up some control over your board, right? Yeah. So as someone who doesn't take board seats and I don't want them and I just, I, I don't think it makes sense particularly early. I think these people can be good partners and the right way to think about it is you as a, you as a founder need to think about who's going to be a good partner for your company. And this is one thing I hope people would walk away from this podcast doing. Like no one ever asked me like, how big's your fund? When do you need an exit? Like, what is your business model? No, no one ever says that to me. I have that conversation with founders a lot, as in, yeah. we're, and we're going to raise a Series A. It's like, all right, let's think about partners that are going to be aligned with us long term. You can do that. I actually think the number is probably less than ninety nine percent of the time we're aligned. We're probably maybe we're aligned eighty percent of the time. It's also very different because because like you're a seed investor and you don't take yeah, board seats, and so yeah. I think there's a big difference between. You know, seed investors are often, you know, just financially their incentives are more aligned with yeah, with well entrepreneurs have stock, right? because, like, yeah, you basically have yeah. common stock. You know, particularly as the company, the, the the farther along the company gets, the more you know, sort of you're aligned with the common stock rather. Than you know, preferred. I'll tell you where um, we're not though. I mean, we're still playing a game where I'm looking for that billion dollar outcome, and it turns out that most of the time when we're investing, 
I mean, if we're doing our job well, we're looking for things that could be that. But a year in, it's often obvious that it's not. And probably it's in my best interest to have that company go raise an A anyway, so I can get a markup, so I can look smart, so I can get money to do the next thing. Yeah. Founder alignment is telling that founder, hey, hey listen, this is not a $100 million opportunity even. You should just find a $20 million outcome, do right by yourself and your team and move on. <laughs> or not, or just run the thing, right? That's founder alignment. Um, my economic incentives even there are not aligned with the the founders, right? But I, I sort of, I try to personally take a long view, which is, look, I'm not going to make my money on this one. I'm going to make my money on that Parker Conrad deal that I did. So let's have these people be happy and hopefully we can do another one together. Yeah, hopefully. Um, <laughs> I like that. Um, <laughs> for me, I think where things get really dangerous is when you have an investor that there's no like one thing, but it's some combination of an investor who's who's taking a board seat, who has larger ownership, is putting a larger amount of their fund to work, where suddenly it changes from them sort of feeling like they're along for the ride to them feeling an obligation to like make sure that things like happen in like the right way. Because then you get, you know, just I think there's a dangerous dynamic of having someone who has very little context day to day about your company, like no matter how brilliant they are, they just don't have sort of an on the ground reality of, of, of sort of what, what they don't have that perspective, as well as they feel like they need to add value somehow. And so they're sitting around each day trying to think about like, okay, what, what should I be doing with this company? And, you know, there's, there's really only one lever that an investor ultimately has. And they have, they have like a giant red button on their desk and they come into work each day and, you know, they sort of say, well, you know, we don't, we don't press that red button here. Like that's not, that's not what we do. But every once in a while, you know, they, you know, something, something's going wrong. There's something bad that's happening. And I was just like, well, what do I do? What do I do? Should I press the red button? Is today the day? It's like, no, 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 we don't do that. And, but then eventually over the course of, you know, sort of a, a long sort of the life cycle of a company, the risk is that, you know, someone's like, screw it. Let's see what happens. You, know? you probably say <laughs> that the best thing you can do is just not give up control of your board, right? That's number one. But let's say most founders can't do that. I don't even think that really... When I said that I thought my view of this was like very nihilistic, I, I meant it because like I don't actually have an, an answer for people. Do you, um, I mean, how do you diligence well, investors? Like... Based on what you learned at Zenefits, what have you done differently with Rippling? You said this Eric Tornberg guy. Did you call his? Did you yeah. call his references? Did you call his mom? Like, how how did you um, figure this out? I think what most entrepreneurs should be looking for an investor is like a do no harm. Investor. Yeah. Look, it's great. I mean, there are. But I'm going to um, say that I've look, had investors I've never... that have been incredibly value add, but it's also it just seems like the they're more likely than not to to be the opposite. I mean, I'll tell you. What, I'll give you. But you know, for the podcast audience. Uh, my advice is always, um, if you're really trying to diligence an investor, um, ask for a list of their companies, ask for the ones that didn't go great and call those founders. Cause yeah. I mean, I think when it's all going well, everybody's happy and everybody's cool and it's fine. It's, it's when things go sideways that you figure out, you know, who freaks out and who's there for you. So that would, that would be my generic advice. I mean, I think that's, that's, that's a great idea. First of all, like most of the people that you're going to call are probably not, there's no sort of like profit for them. Yeah, upside, yeah. And there's no upside in, in kind of trashing the investor even if things didn't go well. So I've been shocked about just the number of founders I've spoken with who, you know, publicly say great things about their investors and, um, you know, their investors would introduce you to them as references and then, you know, over beers with another founder are like, oh my gosh, you know, this, we wouldn't believe this guy trying to sue you. Point, yeah, yeah, know, all this kind of stuff, and I think that if someone sat down, I think if you you spoke with sort of a bunch of sort of late stage, privately held companies, and you asked them if you did it all over again and you had a choice when when raising money from your Series A investor of having them on your board or not, I would bet that nine out of ten of them would say they would they would rather not have had them on the board. What would be your optimal board? I'm curious. Like obviously we, we're in this world where VCs take board seats. How would you construct a board? My optimal board would be a bunch of people that whose advice I valued that weren't investors. Yeah. That weren't, you know, where there wasn't sort of this the the weird dynamic and the sort of incentives that can come into play. You know, someone someone gets into a situation where you know, they feel like, you know, their neck is on the line or, you know, they've got their own reasons that they need something to happen that sort of can very often run counter to the interests of the company. If you have a, if you have a group of just like purely independent people, that doesn't happen. I don't think that's realistic though. I mean, I think the reality is that investors want and need board seats 
for all the reasons that we mentioned. You know, a lot of sort of the power that investors have is ultimately about sort of that kind of brand dynamic. Um, like, I don't think you can keep, you can maintain board control, but it, like, I think a lot of the investors that don't insist on board control, they don't insist on board control because they're smart enough to realize that they can effectively control the company without it. And control and future financings. And wh- whether that's through protective provisions around future financings and exits and things like that, or even just the sort of um, the the sort of moral authority that comes with being, you know, a board member investor. You know, I talked with a founder at one point who told me about sort of a Series A investor that you know there was something that came up, and you know that Series A investor like threatened to sue him. Was like, hey, if you don't if you don't do this, like we're going to sue you, and then then what are you going to do, right? Like your lead investor suing you. <clears throat> You'll never work in this town again. Yeah, yeah. How's your company ever going to raise money from here from here on out? You know, there, there's no way. I mean, as a founder, you're kind of like, it doesn't matter that you have board control. You're kind of like, I can have board control over like, you know, a flaming dumpster fire or, or I can like do what the investor says. Um, so I think like the, the sort of, the sort of like origins or the source of like VC power over companies is it's not it's not really about board control it's just it's the fact that you know every subsequent investor is going to go talk to your board member VC whether that board member VC has you know one vote out of five or or three votes out of five like it doesn't really matter and you need that that person to be you need your company to be at the top of that person's list for the company that they're like, this company kicks ass, or you're in deep trouble, like very, very deep trouble. When you said you'll never work in this town again, it made me think of this old article that came out about Naval Ravikant, I think in like 2005, 2006, when he had had a, I think, a issue with um, his previous investors, I think it was August and Benchmark. Benchmark, yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And I think there was a quote in there that said, you know, someone said he'd never work in this town again. By the way, I think, I think VCs do that all the time. I think that's people don't talk about it. Threatened founders. I mean, I've heard from so many founders whose like VCs have threatened to sue them, and most of the time it doesn't actually happen. It doesn't. It doesn't come through, and you know things get like worked out. But it's definitely it's a lever that I think investors have is that sort of pulling that with founders. You know, it's funny. I, I feel like it resonates with me when you say like it's hard to find some of this information. But I'll tell you, I keep a list and I'll tell anybody, you know, like, can you tell us for the podcast? Exactly. Like, I'm not going to uh, say it should, on the podcast. Should we read the, read the list? This, out? No, this is We're going to make some but, friends. But that's exactly part of, <laughs> it, that's if, part of the issue, right? Is like, you know, you've got a list. Like, I mean, I've got a list, you know, like, you know, I had one of my companies recently that a VC really did something shady and I, like, they called me and asked for advice and I was just yelling in my phone uh, on the streets of San Francisco. I'm, we're going to just do these idiots know what they're doing. And the call to arms was great. Like, no one involved in this deal is ever going to work with these morons again. It was a relatively young firm doing something really stupid for reasons that made sense to them. And now we know. We just don't work with those folks again. So I I think there is some of this where it's like when VCs feel screwed by other VCs, there's institutional memory there. You've just got to find the ones who are not going to do that. Well, I think it's – I mean, it's one of the powerful things about – Things like Y Combinator, you know, is they're almost like a union for entrepreneurs on this stuff, and they they maintain some institutional memory behind the scenes of of these kinds of things. I generally think, by the way, that for entrepreneurs, <clears throat> the right answer if you encounter something like that is to fight it. You know, is to not not back down and just be like, okay, fine, bring it on. Because I mean, just having having talked with a lot of other entrepreneurs who did that, and having discovered that like most of the time investors don't follow through on it, you know, that it, it it's sort of a bluff to assert control. Well, and understand their, you know, incentive structure as well. In the case that I mentioned, this fund had put a meaningful percentage of its first fund into this company. It had been marked up relatively significantly. The company needed more money going through a rough patch. They had provided some money and then gone back and said, actually, we want a bunch of warrants on some un- unreasonable term. And what they hadn't thought through was like, actually, you have the leverage because these guys need to go raise another fund. And if you call their bluff on this and they really take action against you, they have to mark down their portfolio. It's going to be really bad for them, but they're acting out of fear. And so understanding that basically a theme of this podcast for me is understand your VC's business model. I said, that's really interesting. I didn't, I didn't even, I didn't even think about that, that you get into a situation like that as an entrepreneur. Well, look, that's what, I mean, I think maybe you, you alluded to this earlier. Maybe I misunderstand your point. If you're marked up, your meaningful percentage of some fund for some firm, 
that's the guy who's like, I want to come in and quote unquote add value, right? They're the one who's really like, all right, I got to get this thing through, you know, they're getting involved, but you have leverage, right? You, yeah. they need this thing to succeed. You need this thing to succeed. So in an ideal world, you would turn that into a constructive conversation where you're like, Hey man, I appreciate that you want this thing to be successful. Some active listening, right? I need you to add a little bit less value. Here's a list of things <laughs> I could have you doing over here, but trust me. I'm stressed out about this more than you, yeah. you know? No, it makes sense. Later stage, you know, series A, series B, board members, where else are their incentives misaligned or where are they most misaligned or what can entrepreneurs learn from understanding the, the real business models besides what? I mean, I think it's a useful exercise for any entrepreneur. I do this occasionally where I just show them a spreadsheet that's like, here's my business model. Here's how many investments I'm making. Here's the distribution. It's of outcomes. Here's the one that matters. And what we don't know is, are you this one or one of the other 20, right? And understanding, for example, um, you know, how to think about fund size with respect to uh, the kind of investment A somebody's going to make. Maybe somebody can't write less than a $20 million check and you just don't need that. It's not good for the company. Don't talk to those people, right? Something that I've encountered more and more is founders who have been grinding for five years and they actually could raise a Series A, but the self-aware ones are like, man, I'm just so tired. I don't know if I want to get on that treadmill. And some people are just like, they don't think and they just go do it. So thinking about what you want your company to be should inform the kind of partners you take on. Because, man, if you take my check, and you don't want to do something that's good for my business model, that's when we're gonna have problems. Now, if something goes wrong, that's okay, right? Like, you know, we invest in companies all the time that don't work. And the people are awesome. And we get excited to do it again. But if you want to take it one direction, that's, you know, you want the nice lifestyle outcome, quote unquote, and I need the venture outcome, and you're just using my money to fund this thing that I didn't have the expectation you were going to do, of course, we're going to have friction. I was talking to an entrepreneur this weekend, and I was really moved. It was a Series B founder, raised it Series B, but when they were going out to raise a Series B, it's him, the CEO, and one board member. Uh, after a few months, the board member thought, hey, this isn't a fundable company and wanted the entrepreneur to sell it. And the entrepreneur didn't want to sell it. And so the board member sort of tried to sort of block the, block the financing. Block the financing. Yeah. 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 And basically the entrepreneur revealed to me that it was like a year long chess game, uh, where finally the entrepreneur ended up raising a series B, ended up kicking the, uh, investor off the board. But the mind games that it took for the entrepreneur to do that just added incalculable amount of stress. And this is because the Series A person said, hey, look, what's going to happen here is there's not a big enough opportunity. You're going to raise a m- bunch of money above me in the preference stack, yep. and I'm never going to get my money out. Mm-hmm. It's fine to disagree about that, but hopefully the conversation was about the best interest of the company, right? Like, if it is, I don't know, do you, do you have an opinion on was this, was this, there is Series B, they better be a billion-dollar company. Yeah. Are they a billion-dollar company? I hope so. I don't, I think, I think it's too early. I don't have a strong enough, uh, strong enough view, but uh, the entrepreneur certainly thinks so. Parker Conrad, you would say fight harder. <laughs> you would, what would you say? The entrepreneurs right there who's struggling with their board or. Yeah, I'd say fight harder. And I'd also, I mean, I just, I hear stories like that. And that's where I kind of go back to like <clears throat> the original conversation that, that Parker and Parker, that, that, that I was having with Parker here about, about sort of like investors being sort of the adjudicators of this stuff. And, you know, why, why is it that they have that power and that control? And, you know, the reason that they have that power and that authority is they've negotiated the sort of, you know, preferred right in the financing where they get to sort of block any subsequent financing transaction if they want to. And so, you know, one question is like, should investors have those rights? And, you know, and should you as an entrepreneur allow them to have it? Um, now the, the, the real answer is like, you don't have a choice because like those are standard deal terms. You know, you can try and negotiate those out, but it's like really hard to do. But it doesn't in a lot take of cases. A but the question, but then the question is it. like, as like a tech ecosystem, like just like for, as, from a bigger picture thing, like if you were to design sort of this system, like would you give investors those rights? And I think that th- those rights are probably more often misused by investors than they are like used used effectively to sort of like any sort of bit of power that investors have. They often end up sort of using to kind of like squeeze the company to get something that they want. And it's, you know, it's right there. You know, look, they're fiduciaries to their LPs. Like, you know, they have to, you yeah. know, maximize their returns. And, you know, sometimes... It's like the plumber is a fiduciary. Never mind. Right, right, exactly. Never mind. <laughs> um, I mean, I mean, a lot of this is I felt like, I feel like if, you know, if, if people just talk more honestly about what investors were and what, what this relationship was, 
it would be a lot better. It's you know, it's 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 when people are talking about investors as service providers to entrepreneurs and things yeah, like yeah, that that yeah. it just like really gets muddy and 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 then entrepreneurs are surprised when their plumber comes and tells them like listen i'm 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 going to eject a stream of liquid sewage in your living room unless you move out and give me the keys to your house right you know like plumbers don't do that but like vcs do yeah i mean one thing i would say here is like i mean you you feel free to disagree about this but i i think i subscribe to the the you know the hunter walk school of how we should talk about vcs which is uh, most of them are good people. We shouldn't give them permission to be, we shouldn't expect them to be evil because then we give them permission to do evil. I think most of them by and large are good. And I think probably like the way that I would interpret the situation that you just gave us, Eric, was like, look, this VC thought that they had the right answer for the company and for the founder. The founder thought that he or she had the, you know, the uh, right answer yeah, you should always go with your, I mean, you're the founder. You should always go with your, do do what you think is right. You should just always do that, right? But try to hear, try, right. just try to hear this other person. And hopefully if they're articulate and they're well-meaning, you at least hear it. And then you make the call, right? That's what we said. And when they board. disagree, the investor shouldn't ch- try to stop. I mean, I, I am not a Series B board member or Series A board member sitting there worried about my $10 million check. So I don't want to speak for those people. Um, I feel like we have a, we, we have a luxury, like your seed investors have this luxury, right? We might as well be buying common. We're going to make our money on the big winners. So it's just easier for us to, you know, help you do what's right for you. So I, you know, I'll leave it to a series A investor to sort of rationalize or defend that scenario. I think another point's worth picking on is, um, you mentioned union for entrepreneurs and YC is sort of like an accidental union, right? In some ways, but should there be more formal <laughs> union of entrepreneurs negotiating for their own rights. Oh, sign me up. I just started here. Look, <laughs> You know, YC started their Series A program recently, which I think is like just really fascinating because look, I don't know where it's going to go or what's going to happen with it, but I think that is a potential vehicle. Like, you know, in, in the seed realm, like YC really standardized a lot. They standardized deal documents, like basic terms, like not like, you know, they didn't standardize like the valuation cap, but like everything else about a seed round is like largely predetermined by the sort of template documents that they created. You know, they they turned the fundraising process into something where, you know, you have like a sort of a, enough investors that are looking at the company all at once to have like a real a real auction. And you know, I think if YC was able to do that for, you know, later rounds and it would look different. I mean, you probably wouldn't have like a 3-minute demo day pitch. Um you'd have to do something different, but if they were able to like you know, take this and standardize deal documents and say, look, investors, you know, no, they're not allowed to block future financing rounds. And, um, you know, this is what sort of board composition looks like. And these are the, the, the preferred rights, you know, that they have and the ones that they don't. And they could, um, uh, you know, I think it would be hugely destructive to the, the VC business model. I, I think the biggest challenge for both entrepreneurs and investors when you're raising these later rounds of capital is you have this like limiting factor around your time. And I didn't realize this until I first went out to do this myself. But what happens is a lot of times, I mean, and you guys know this, but a lot of times when a deal is really hot, like it's, it's blindingly obvious to everyone that this company is going to be really successful. You know, everyone in the ecosystem is like, this is obviously going to be or a everybody huge... thinks it is. And sometimes they're wrong, but like, you know, there's usually a lot of consensus that I'm sure that like when Uber raised their Series A, everyone was yeah. like, this is going to be really big. And so the question is, the, the problem is, is that when you're an entrepreneur and you're in that situation, um, one of the things you run up against is that if you're going to raise money, you need to go to these like Monday morning partner meetings and like everyone holds them on Mondays. You know, that means that, you know, if you have a process where things are moving, like investors are not going to give you a term sheet and give you three weeks to decide. They're going to give you 24 hours to decide and then you're going to negotiate for 48. So that means that in practice, you've got to have GP meetings with all of the investors that are might participate in your round on the same Monday, which means like you can, you can really have at most like six <clears throat> and you can't really cast a wider net than that. And that's why, like, I think brand ends up being so important to these investors. And it's why the returns for the top tier institutional investors are so much better than all the rest. Because if you're an entrepreneur and you, you, you know very little about this industry, you've stumbled onto just like lightning with something that you're building. It's clear to everyone that that's the case. Who do you talk to? You talk to the people you read about in the newspaper, right? Like that's, 
you know, you talk to, you know, Sequoia and Benchmark and, you know, like a couple of other firms. If you're like the third tier investor, like you might recognize that that company is amazing, but you don't even get the meeting. You know, that's the sort of challenge that they have. And from an entrepreneur's perspective, you know, when there's only like five firms that you're speaking with, there's a limit to sort of how much you can negotiate, you know, terms and valuation and things like that. Like it gets just a lot trickier. Yeah. I mean, I think where I'd I'd rewind a little bit and say, when you talk about this union for entrepreneurs, I mean, I I think your takeaway as an entrepreneur needs to be the union isn't going to worry about you. You're just one of 125 companies in the batch or whatever it is. And I mean, I think what we don't, what we don't think about is all the suboptimal outcomes that come out of the power of the union. So like you go through YC and there's demo day, there's an auction process and you're going to get a better price coming out of that than any other process, right? But price is just one component in this overall process, right? Like what you're trying to do is build a team, a plan and finance it so that you can get this thing to the next stage. And I think it's obvious the, the, the metric, right? The obvious metric is how much money did we raise at what price? And you need those other pieces there as well. So I, I think what I worry about sometimes, um, not, not to pick on YC, but um, I think there's a lot of companies that, you know, they optimize for the metric that they see. They want to raise as much as their friend and they die. And we don't talk, I mean, it's, it's hard to see all of the counterfactuals, right? You don't see the companies that could have done well had they optimized maybe for these other pieces. So I'm a much bigger fan of finding people early in your fundraising process that are going to help you put together the right syndicate of investors who have been through it before, who can help you think about what are the right milestones and strategy, and then using that fundraising process. Like, I don't, I don't know your company. I, I don't know what to tell you what to do in specific terms with your company, but I can tell you in generic terms what I've seen across 15 other companies that have been in your space, at your stage what kind of risks and issues they're likely to encounter along the way and how they're likely to be judged 18 months from now. And I think that's where sort of if no one is there on your shoulder working with you closely and giving a shit, you're likely to just optimize for, for the things that are obvious to see. So uh, union is great, but, you know, find yeah. somebody who really cares. So let me add a curiosity because I've never really understood. I'm probably the only person who's like – like really unsure of this idea that like, you know, prices and everything on financing. Cause I get that that's like not the conventional wisdom, but let me just like play devil's advocate a little bit on this. Like what, how do companies by getting more money for the 10% of the company that they're selling? Cause like most of the time, you know, people want to get like say 10% of the company. How is it that companies get killed by raising $4 million instead of three for 10% of the company. So it's interesting. I have this theory that companies that raise less, they sell less than 15% of a round uh, markedly increase their chance of failure. Um, I don't know if it's true. I need to get some data around this, but... Um, or whatever percentage you want. Yeah, whether like, it's 20% look, or 10%. The question is like, at any given level of ownership, it seems like, it's always seemed just like, like sort of every everyone... When people talk about, oh, well, it's not all about valuation, like, look, I get it. Like, no, but the most let me important thing is actually, I think, to get out of the fundraising process fast so that you can get back to like building the company because that's the only thing that's going to save you. But while you're in it, you know, if you look at it as like, look, I'm selling 20% of my company, say, how is it bad for the company to get $4 million for 20% of their company rather yeah. than three or $5 million? To say that it's bad for companies to raise more money, it sort of implies that like the people running the company are kind of like bad capital allocators. No, you know, it's the, look, they get profligate. They get and like, look, I get it. There are companies that are like that, but it seems like as an entrepreneur, if you're the type of entrepreneur that because you raised five million instead of three. You're gonna start. You're gonna get like the fancy office and the no. Air that's on not. Chair. The, I mean, that is a problem, but that's not the real problem. Well, you're gonna fail anyway. I guess, like, convince me. Like, why is it worse to raise five instead of three million for twenty percent of the company? Yeah. So I think what you see oftentimes it's not that you're raising, um, you know, three versus five, and the valuation is nine versus um, I don't know twelve or something. Right. It's that. You can be in a position, and I'm, I'm again, my experience is mostly seed. So I, I talk about seed. I tend to think financings are much more uh, responsible later on, right? There's more adults around the table. Like I, I saw a company come out of YC, and I'm not picking on there's YC. The, there's here. the adult children. Uh, uh, yeah, exactly, exactly. <laughs> 
fair to call me on it. You know, I saw a company and I, I, I love this founder and I'd known him for many years. And, you know, they came out of YC and they raised 1 million on 16 with a network effects pre-product business. And I, and, and I said to him, look, I, I don't think this is good for the company. I think you guys are super talented. I think this is a phenomenal idea. If I were you guys, I would raise 500K at whatever, let's say five, six, seven. I, I, I don't know, I'm not really that price sensitive. I'm not worried about sort of my ownership stake. But what I would do is I would build a phenomenal product and I'd go out to market saying, hey, look, we raised a small amount of money. We built a phenomenal product. And now we want to raise two, three, four million dollars to go drive adoption of this. And the reason that was my advice is because I felt like what was going to happen to this company if they raise, I think actually in the end they raised about one and a half was one and a half was too much money to go back to market and be judged just on product. They were going to have to show meaningful adoption, right? But it wasn't enough money to get all the way to millions of users in the kind of round that was going to allow them to do sort of the next phase of what they wanted to do. So I felt like had this been a round where they raised 500K at who cares what the valuation is or $5 million, both of those would have been better for the company than what they did. What they did was optimize to sell, you know, less but than 10%. Isn't that really an objection about the amount of money that they raised and not about the valuation? Like, because when, when you said like raise 500K well, at seven or eight million, yeah. so, my initial thing is like, well, why raise 500K at seven or eight million in order to raise two or three million later? Why not raise the two or three million right now at a at a sixteen million dollar valuation? And because I agree, you know, with you know, if you're raising at those at that level, you can buy down some more risk for the company. Yeah, I think there's two other problems with the valuation. One is that if you're raising that kind of round, you're going to get it a hundred k at a time. So this is a problem in two ways, right? I think it is a hundred times harder to raise a million dollar check than it is to raise a hundred K check because people writing million dollar checks are just going to think a lot harder about it, right? They're going to yeah. look for a better plan. I think as an entrepreneur, you should run towards that rather than away from it, right? And the other is what happens if this company doesn't get where it needs to go? What you want is partners that are going to be there to put more money in and help it get there because no new money is coming into this company. If it's not there, it's done, right? So you're so, saying they weren't able to find easily three million dollars at think that they, valuation. I, which I totally get like if you raise it at a price where you can't raise enough because there's not enough demand, then like that's a huge mistake. Or just people will look at it and say, look, the risk adjusted return on this versus another deal is just not there. I, I'm about finding a fair price. I'm actually not a price hawk, right? I feel like yeah. the you know the big opportunities are gonna make a ton of money. So like five versus seven versus ten, it's not that big a deal. But Look, if I put 100K into your company at 15, I own a very small percentage of it, right? Yep. So even if I have a big fat pile of money, if you come back to me and you're like, look, man, I'm, I'm, we're doing okay. We agree we did a decent job, but we didn't knock it out of the park and we need another million bucks. I'm just going to be less incentivized to help you get there than somebody who put a million bucks in this thing out of their $30 million fund and really was there um, as a partner from the beginning. So I think... To some extent, raising in an up round matters. To some extent, having partners that are more invested in the company matters. To some extent, just the money correlates with having to have a better plan. As you And you as an entrepreneur circling back to where this started was, I think an attitude adjustment that many founders should take is, you know, you just said like, look, you should go into this fundraising process and get it done as fast as possible. I think you should be optimizing for something else. I think you should go into this fundraising process and say, look, I know more about my business than anybody I'm going to talk to. But these people are all smart. They see a lot of things I don't see. I'm going to use this as an opportunity to improve my plan. I want to come out of this fundraising not just with a pile of money. I want to come out with the right milestones, the right money, and the right partners so that I can succeed. And that's where if the VC is getting back to the founder-friendly thing, if I think my role is just to sell you, if I just think I'm a salesperson, you're just going to get none of that, right? Like we should have a frame where I walk in and a good VC meeting for a founder should be, you know what? I walked out of here with some good ideas. That's how you as a founder should evaluate me as an investor is like, I walked out of this meeting and I had good ideas and I want to have another call with this person later so that I can get some more good ideas. Not because they know how to run my business, but because actually I could run my business better if I had this interaction um, over time. Actually, I had a question about one of those things. You said, if I own a little bit more and someone comes to me and they're like, eh, things are not going great. Can we have another million bucks? I'd be more inclined to do it. Do investors actually ever do that? Because like my, my assumption and what I tell people is like, 
you should assume you're never going to get any more money. And the only way that you're going to get more money is if you, your metrics are like so unbelievable yeah. that no one can, can, no one can ignore you. No one can ignore and you. And so yeah. the idea that like investors will give a, a company with mediocre metrics like more money. No, but it's not mediocre metrics. You know to what sort it of is. like just tie them along. I, I mean, I, like maybe that, it's never happened for me. But, no, but, but there's, maybe, look. You know, you as a founder have faith in what you're doing and you come to me and you don't have numbers and I'm like, I don't know, man, I can't see it. Right. And you're like, if you're, if you're rational, which is hard to be, you'd be like, I understand why you can't see it because you're not in my day to day. So I think what happens is a team is going along and they're doing well, but the numbers don't reflect the opportunity. Right. So I've had this happen a bunch of times where you know, if you're close with a company and you're working with them, you know, you raise a million and a half, you think you're going to get there, some A and B and C went wrong, you're not quite there, you need another six to nine months. Personally, I love these rounds, because I have asymmetric information. It's very rational for me to write a check into this company and irrational for the Series A investor. So I'm going to write that check, right? We're going to do the, let's say the seed at six, I'm happy to put another half million dollars into this company with a syndicate of people to get you much better positioned for that Series A, which in this market is further and further out as funds get bigger and bigger. That's a win. If we can do that and split the difference and do it at 12, and then the A is going to be at 24 or 30 because who, you know, the Series A folks don't care what they're going to pay. You know, overstatement, but which um, Series A investors? Are yeah. if you could, um, maybe yeah. if you could make a list of those uh, Series A investors for everyone listening. Yeah, exactly. We'll put it on the website. Yeah. We'll, 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 we'll do these one of those. Series A investors don't care what they pay. Go talk to them. You might know some folks who are very uh, generous at valuation. Actually, look. A general rule on that, on all seriousness, is the larger the fund size, the more price insensitive they're going to be on the Series A check. And just to get maybe this is too much inside baseball, but look, if you've got a billion dollar fund and you need to put 75 to 100 million dollars into a company, you're not going to do that in the Series A. So if you're writing Series A checks, you're more worried about, you know, getting that Parker Conrad company and having the option to put another 50 million bucks into the next round and so on and so forth than you are about exactly what your entry point is because your blended cost basis is going to be the average of your valuations across all those rounds. And you're putting a lot more money into the later financings in the first one. So that would lead someone with a large fund to be price insensitive where, um, you know, I might be super price insensitive to that crazy A valuation that's not merited by the traction in your business. Yeah. So I'd rather invest to help you get there. And I've had, you know, big firms double, double valuations on a regular basis on checks that I've written into pre-series A companies in six months. It's great. I mean, I, you know, it's an, a great place in the market to be as an investor. And I think you're seeing that, right? So from the outside, you look at this and you hear about pre-seed and seed and seed plus an A, and it just sort of seems absurd. But it's a reflection of the fund sizes and the strategies and how everybody's yeah. trying to make money in this ecosystem. Should there be a glass door for VCs? I think there's there's a couple of people who have tried to do that. I remember one, one yeah, like 2008 or 2009, there was someone who, um, I'm trying to remember. Bill Kaplan, I think, Fuck VC or FUVC or... Do you remember this? There was um, the funded. The funded. That's that's what I was thinking of. Yeah, yeah. I don't know why the why those things haven't worked. I think it's just one of those things where most most people are not willing to talk about this stuff. It's really hard, right? Like, who's got an incentive to say negative things? Who's got an incentive to say positive things? I mean, I think the version that I would really like of this is an entirely positive version. That's just about. Like, I think a real problem in venture capital, at least in the, the, you know, pre-product market fit stage is just getting your first yes, getting people who are really going to make their own decisions and act with conviction and not just wait for momentum. I really think that that's what's missing early. And so I would love to see a site where founders just go and say, look, here are the people who really said yes to me early, made my round happen. Um, cause I think like when you're a founder and you're going out to raise money, you don't care about the last check. That's going to be easy, right? You're just looking for the people who are willing to say yes without asking, well, who, who else is investing, right? So I think that's what founders could really use early. And I don't know, I'd be curious about your opinion, but I think by the time you get to Series A, 
you actually have a support system around you. You have an ecosystem, you know, a bunch of founders, you have a bunch of investors around you. So it just doesn't feel like that's a real problem so much as this, this early stage is messy. It's where all the opportunity is, in my opinion, but it's also like really hard if you're a founder trying to navigate it. So if you guys at Village Global want to build that, I will be your free product manager. Sounds good. I, I mean, I sort of take like the opposite view, which is, which is, I think that like the whole nature, it's inherent in the dynamic of, you know, VC investors having LPs that they need to answer to that. I think like most of these guys, you put their back against the wall and they'll slit your throat for a nickel. And I don't think the problem is like there, you have to identify one or two bad ones. I think it's that. You know, this is just like most of these investors, the incentives are very different from yours. And, and I think, you know, I, like I don't, I don't have like an answer on like how you avoid that, but I don't think it's that. Get like, profitable, make money. Like I had a, there's, there's, there was, so in fact, the, the guy that I was mentioning who, who, uh, who, who, that I mentioned earlier in the podcast who told me that his Series A board member had threatened to sue him. Subsequently, his, this guy's Series A board member, gave this guy's name to me as a reference. Like, so I think that there's like definitely like a weird sort of like, I don't, I think the problem is like, you don't, you just genuinely don't hear a lot of these stories. I'm sure like most people that he spoke with, you know, as a reference, you know, he gave like glowing testimonials mm-hmm. to because, you know, why wouldn't he? Any, any, unless you want to plug Rippling or any, any last things you want to plug? You know, um, my new company is called Rippling. The basic idea is that, you know, with the sort of um, the deadweight loss of the SaaS revolution, I think has been that businesses now have like a hundred different systems they're using to run the company. And I'm convinced that there's this incredible administrative pain of just having to manage employee information across HR systems and IT systems. So you really see this when you hire someone, you have to, you know, get documents signed, add them to payroll and benefits and other things. But you also create their email account and get them key card access to your office and set them up in Salesforce and GitHub and AWS and other systems. So the idea behind Rippling is that it's an all-in-one HR and IT system where you can manage employee information um, across all those different systems. So you have a button to hire someone and we get their documents signed. We set them up in payroll benefits and HR systems, but we also set up their access to all your different third-party apps and services, things like email and Slack and Dropbox. And we also ship them a computer. So it's kind of like all of the stuff that an employee needs on day one, we don't care whether it's like HR's job or IT's job or the legal department's responsibility or part of the finance organization. We kind of give you one system that stretches across all of those things. And we can automate huge amounts of administrative work for companies. Cool. Awesome. Thank you so much for both coming on Thanks. the podcast. Turpentine VC is a podcast from Turpentine, the network behind Moment of Zen and Econ 102. If you liked the episode, please leave a review in the Apple Store or rate us on Spotify.